Ghost of Yote, the sequel to the beloved Ghost of Tsushima, was announced a couple days ago, but rather than being received with raucous applause, it has been met with cold hesitance from many in the anti-workist side of the internet, due to rather overt and strident political alignments of both employees and the primary voice actor, who also introduces a new female main character to the game. So this has been a bit of a divide right now, and it is understandable that it is, as at the moment, I've talked about this previously, but the right wing is in ascendance. Now how much of a right wing movement it is, etc., is something that is yet to be determined, and as it becomes ascendance, it has to wrestle with various questions that we didn't need to worry about when we were the underdogs struggling against the absolutely overwhelming cultural force of the left. Left. And one of those is, what's too much? When do we declare a game to be woke? What kind of evidence do we need? Do we need any at all? Is the mere implication of wokeness enough to condemn an entire project? And this is but one of a whole heaping heck of a lot of ethical and moral considerations that we need to engage with these days. Though. They are actually rather complex. Now, Ghost of Yorte, I think, actually is not that difficult one to uh, figure out an opinion on because of a couple of reasons that we'll look at in a second. But I will mention that cancelling games and their creators merely for their political alignment, well, that is something that we have seen the progressive left do a lot. And this is in part a tool that we have taken from the left as well. When we see a video game developer that is actively hostile towards us, we will absolutely use that against them, and we will, in our own way, attempt to cancel them too, because we damn well know that that's a weapon they have more than happily wielded against us, and thus, it is entirely morally justifiable. But. What we've got for the Ghost of Yorte here is a little bit more thin. One, a female protagonist. Not necessarily a problem at all. Two, some of the development team are... Mm, a hint suspicious. Eric Jensen here. Senior staff game designer on Ghost of Yorte at Sucker Punch Productions. Opinions are mine. So that alone does matter for something. See, here's the thing. A lot of the writers for Warhammer 40,000, the Black Library writers, are progressive as sin. Far, far lefties. Which is understandable because in their particular uh, in, well, area of expertise and employment, creative writing, you're either left-wing or you're ostracized. So, hmm, you know, there is always that to consider. But so long as they're able to actually push aside their personal preferences and just make a piece of 40k entertainment, I don't actually care if they're left-wing. And it might very well be the same here. Though, well, here's the thing. New PlayStation Pride 2023 merch. Games are made for everyone and are made by everyone. This is, of course, not correct. In fact, every time I have seen a game made for everyone, it has been unequivocally so a piece of shit. Because you cannot make a game for everyone. By definition, if you are trying to do so, you are making a game for no one. We like specific things. We are not merely attracted to bland, uninteresting paste. And the more you water down a project's uniqueness to make it appeal to as many people as possible, the less of an interesting the game it is. You will never get a Call of Duty bro interested in grand strategy any more so than you will get somebody addicted to Hearts of Iron to enjoy the casual rounds of Call of Duty the aforementioned person enjoys. This is a lesson the games industry has largely forgotten. And as for made by everyone, again, no, it's made by people who are interested in games. Or well, I suppose you've got me on that one. It was at least made by people interested in games. This is a worrying sentiment, but so long as he sticks true with keeping his opinions for himself, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that either. The biggest issue, however, is... 
Erika Ishii. So the park place here has made a pretty damn nice little summary of some of her more strident takes, shall we say. She is not merely a progressive, she is an arch progressive, racial activist and everything. She is the image of a modern day leftist that has no understanding of, well, the implications of what she is doing. She is the kind of person who will call racism to be the worst crime in human history whilst championing racism more than happily on her own spare time. Erika Ishii is in all due likelihood, best case scenario, simply not very clever. Worst case scenario, actively malicious as she realizes that championing uh, a special behavior or a behavior, um, English, special treatment, there we go, for people of color might somehow benefit her, or how benefiting trans people might also benefit her as well, as she is listed as having all pronouns. That might just be the leftiest thing I have ever actually seen. And what is worse is, because all of this, again, if we go by the example of Eric Jensen, so long as he keeps his opinions to himself, nothing wrong, right? Absolutely. However, Erika Ishii has an observable history of changing the projects she's been a part of. I cannot believe they left in an Ayn Rand burn I improvised in Justice League Bless the DC Animated Universe. Now this too, uh, okay, you know, it's an Ayn, Ayn Rand joke. It is a political joke, but it's a bit of a fringe one, so perhaps not that bad. It's not overtly woke either, so yeah, there's, there's an, a degree of doubt there. But this proves that she has previously improvised scripts. She has changed the letter of the script handed to her for her own reasons. Now, how widespread is this? Who knows? Is one example a pattern? No. Could it have happened only once? Absolutely. Could it have happened multiple times? Oh, God, yes. As the other project she's been involved in is, amongst other things, Dragon Age The Veil Guard, which looks absolutely awful, and again, leans heavily in on the non-gendering type, uh, type. The characters are unattractive, the characters are boring looking, the gameplay is boring looking, and everybody is omnisexual. Not even player sexual, they will simply just bang literally anything, and if you don't pick them up, they'll simply turn towards another party member and bang them instead. And Mortal Kombat 1, which recently launched, uh, which she is rolling in, uh, Erika Ishii reveals Sector that she is the voice actor for, well, guess what, they've been gender swapped. Yeah. See, here's the thing. Where there is smoke, there is very often fire. Is it an absolute certainty? No, of course not. Should one react and condemn the game before we know anything beyond the trailer? No, that too is unreasonable. Should one be worried, however? Absolutely. We talked about this in the 40k video I did a few days ago on why Warhammer 40k is inherently right-wing. In that video, I laid out the idea of moral foundations theory, which suggests that the various political leanings view the world quite differently. The right is capable of connecting with all of the key moral points and thus see the world through those, whereas the left only connects with two out of five moral points, which gives them a radically different world view. This also makes them view anyone who holds points uh, moral values beyond those two as anti them. It makes them view them as evil, as ob objects that get in their way for their primary moral points, which is, you know, care and fairness. This creates very very, very fanatical people who see evil all around them and will believe themselves to be good, moral, and justified. And so when they see someone that they don't agree with, they very rarely have the self-control necessary to just keep it to themselves. 
These people very often view themselves as moral crusaders, and with a trick like this, uh, sorry, it, I guess, is correct, she absolutely views herself as a moral crusader. When you add a person like this onto a project with other people, I can pretty much guarantee that she is going to try and convert them. And as we again already have an example of her changing the script, you probably should assume she's going to do it again. So, to double this back up again, Ghosts of Yorte is not necessarily woke, because we do not have enough evidence, enough indication at the moment to say anything conclusively. Should you, however, approach the project with a great deal of trepidation and suspicion, yes. If you see anything else that appears woke, you should take note of it, as it is probably not by sheer unadulterated coincidence. We have seen this again and again, that they always begin small, affecting things, undermining things, subverting things, and infiltrating them until they can morally browbeat the company they have joined to do it the way they prefer. I see absolutely no reason why uh, Sucker Punch and the Ghost of series should be any different to that. Perhaps it has a strong leader, perhaps it has a company structure resistant to this. Mayhaps these people will be guided by someone who simply says, no, shut up, we're making a video game. In which case, that's perfectly fine. But we'll wait and see on that, won't we? So, that is my take on Ghost of Yorte. Is it guaranteed woke? No. Should you be very, very observant? Yes. Suspicion. What was, what was that? What was that lovely uh, Russian proverb? Uh, trust, but verify. That. Precisely that. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.